It is a pleasure and indeed an honor to be in your company tonight among friends old and new. My friendship with ISI goes back, I think, to the early 70s when as a graduate student at Harvard, I used to go over to Boston College on certain Saturdays when ISI had a program of bringing in people like Russell Kirk and Will Herberg to speak to anyone who wanted to hear them in the Boston area. And my association with ISI has been an enriching and enlivening part of my life ever since. And it is a special honor to be able to participate in this wonderful weekend. A few years ago, the New York Times technology columnist David Pogue listed the five stages of grieving when you lose your computer files. <laughs> uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and moving to Amish country. <laughs> it sounds like a fair description of the mood gripping some American conservatives tonight. Well, have conservatives lost their computer files in the year 2016? Reacting to our current political upheaval, many observers think so. But before we can assess conservatism's present predicament, we need to understand how the present came to be. This evening, I propose to do so briefly through the lens of the intellectual history of American conservatism since the Second World War and the period after the Second World War when the conservative intellectual community, as we know it, took form. Perhaps the most important thing to assimilate about modern American conservatism is that it is not and has never been monolithic. It is a coalition with many points of origin and diverse tendencies that are not always easy to reconcile. In 1945, at the close of World War II, no articulate, coordinated, conservative intellectual force existed in the United States. There were, at most, scattered voices of protest, some of them profoundly pessimistic about the future of their country and convinced that they were an isolated remnant on the wrong side of history. History, in fact, seemed to be what the left was making. The left, liberals, socialists, even communists, appeared to be in complete control of the 20th century. In the beginning, in the aftermath of the war, there was not one right-wing renaissance, really, but three, each reacting in different ways to challenge from the left. The first of these groupings consisted of classical liberals and libertarians resisting the threat of the ever-expanding collectivist state to individual liberty. Convinced in the 1940s that post-New Deal America was rapidly drifting toward central planning and socialism along what Friedrich Hayek famously called the road to serfdom, these intellectuals offered a powerful defense of free market economics. They helped to make the old verities defensible again after the long nightmare of the Great Depression, when many people on the left had seen the Great Depression as a failure of capitalism. <clears throat> Concurrently, and independently of the classical liberals, a second school of anti-modern liberal thought emerged in America shortly after World War II. The so-called traditionalism of such writers as Richard Weaver and Russell Kirk. Appalled by totalitarianism, total war, and the development of secular, rootless mass society during the 30s and 40s, the traditionalists, as they came to be called, urged a return to traditional religious and ethical absolutes and a rejection of the moral relativism that in their view had corroded Western civilization and produced an intolerable vacuum filled by demonic ideologies on the march. More European oriented and historically minded on the whole than the classical liberals, and less interested in economics, 
The traditionalist conservatives extolled the wisdom of such thinkers as Edmund Burke and called for a revival of religious orthodoxy, of classical natural law teaching, and of mediating communitarian institutions between the solitary citizen and the powerful state. Why did they advocate this? In order, they said, to reclaim and civilize the spiritual wasteland created by secular liberalism and by the false gods it had permitted to enter the gates. From Russell Kirk's monumental tome, The Conservative Mind, published in 1953, the traditionalists acquired something more, an intellectual genealogy and intellectual respectability. After Kirk's book appeared, no longer could contemporary conservatives be dismissed as John Stuart Mill had famously dismissed British conservatives in the 19th century as the stupid party. Indeed, without Kirk's fortifying book, the conservative intellectual community of the past three generations might never have acquired its identity and its name. Third, there appeared in the 1940s and 50s at the onset of the Cold War a militant evangelistic anti-communism shaped by a number of ex-communists and other ex-radicals of the 1930s, including the iconic Whitaker Chambers. These former men and women of the far left and their allies brought to the post-war American right a profound conviction that America and the West were engaged in a titanic struggle with an implacable adversary, communism, which sought nothing less than the conquest of the world. Each of these emerging components of the conservative revival shared a deep antipathy to 20th century liberalism. To the classical liberals and libertarians, modern liberalism the liberalism of Franklin Roosevelt and his successors, was the ideology of the ever-aggrandizing bureaucratic welfare state, which would, if unchecked, become a collectivized totalitarian state, destroying individual liberty and the private sphere of life. To the traditionalists, modern liberalism was inherently a corrosive philosophy which was eating away like an acid, not only at our liberties, but also at the moral and religious foundations of a healthy traditional society, thereby creating a vast spiritual vacuum into which totalitarianism could enter. So the Cold War anti-communists, modern liberalism or progressivism, rationalistic, relativistic, secular, anti-traditional and even quasi-socialist, was by its very nature incapable of vigorously resisting an enemy on its left. Liberalism to them was part of the left and could not effectively repulse a foe with which it shared so many underlying assumptions. As the conservative Cold War strategist James Burnham eventually and trenchantly put it, liberalism was essentially a means for reconciling the West to its own destruction. Liberalism, he said, was the ideology of Western suicide. In the 1950s and early 60s, as we have heard, the three independent wings of the conservative revolt against the left began to coalesce around National Review, founded by William F. Buckley Jr. in 1955. Apart from his extraordinary talents as a writer and public intellectual, Buckley personified each impulse in the evolving coalition. He was at once a traditional Christian, a defender of free enterprise and free market economics, and a fervent anti-communist, a source of his ecumenical appeal to conservatives. As this consolidation began to occur, and as we heard this morning, a severe challenge arose to the conservative identity. 
a growing and, as it turns out, permanent tension between the libertarians and the traditionalists. To the libertarians, the highest good in society was individual liberty, the emancipation of the autonomous self from external, especially governmental, restraint. To the traditionalists, who tended to be more religiously oriented than most libertarians, the highest social good was not unqualified freedom, but ordered freedom, grounded in community and resting on the cultivation of virtue in the individual soul. Such conversion, or cultivation rather, argued the traditionalists, did not arise spontaneously. It needed reinforcement, reinforcement from mediating institutions such as schools, churches, and synagogues, and at times of the government itself. Not surprisingly, this conflict of visions generated a tremendous controversy on the American right in the early 1960s, as conservative intellectuals attempted to sort out their first principles. The argument became known as the freedom versus virtue debate, about which we have heard. It fell to a former communist of all people and chief ideologist at National Review, a man named Frank Meyer, to formulate a middle way of sorts, which, be which became known as fusionism. That is a fusing or merging or balancing of the competing paradigms of the libertarians and the traditionalists. In brief, Meyer argued that the overriding purpose of government, of government was to protect and promote individual liberty, but that the supreme purpose of the free individual should be to pursue a life of virtue, unfettered by and unaided by the state. As a purely theoretical construct, Meyer's fusionism did not convince all his critics then or later. For some, fusionism was, as a theory was reminiscent of the British conservative politician who said, we Tories believe in balance. Balance. On the one hand, sense. On the other hand, nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but as a formula for political action, and as an insight into the actual character of American conservatism, Meyer's project was a considerable success. He taught libertarian and traditionalist purists that they needed each other, and that American conservatism must not become doctrinaire, an ideology, as some would say. It must stand neither for dogmatic anti-statism at one extreme nor for moral authoritarianism at the other, but for a society in which people are simultaneously free to choose and desirous of choosing the path of virtue. In arriving at this modus vivendi, the architects of fusionism were aided immensely by the third element in the growing coalition, anti-communism a viewpoint that nearly everyone could share. The presence in the world of a dangerous external enemy, the Soviet Union, the mortal foe of liberty and virtue, of freedom and faith, was a crucial unifying cement for the nascent conservative movement. Politically, the post-war American right, as I have described it so far, found its first national expression in the campaign of Senator Barry Goldwater for the presidency in 1964, as Lee Edwards explained so well Thursday evening. It was not long after that election that a new impulse appeared on the intellectual scene, one destined to become the fourth component of the conservative coalition. I refer to the phenomenon known as neoconservatism. Irving Kristol's definition conveys its original essence. A neoconservative, he said, is a liberal who has been mugged by reality. <laughs> and maybe some of you have heard the definition of a neoliberal. That is, a liberal who has been mugged by reality 
but refuses to press charges. <laughs> In any case, one of the salient developments of the late 60s and 1970s was the intellectual journey of various liberals and social democrats toward conservative positions and affiliations. By the early 1980s, many of them were participating in the Reagan Revolution. Meanwhile, another development, one destined to have enormous political consequences, began to take shape in the late 1970s. The grassroots great awakening of what came to be known as the religious right, or as we tend to say today, social conservatives. Convinced that American society was in a state of vertiginous moral decline, and that what they called secular humanism, in other words, modern liberalism, was the fundamental cause and agent of this decay, the religious right exhorted its hitherto politically quiescent followers to enter the public arena in defense, in defense of their traditional moral code and way of life. The political landscape, especially in the Republican Party, was transformed. By the end of President Ronald Reagan's second term in 1989, the American right had grown to encompass five distinct impulses, libertarianism, traditionalism, anti-communism, neoconservatism, and the religious right. And just as Buckley had done for conservatives a generation before, so Reagan in the 1980s did the same. He performed an emblematic and ecumenical function, a fusionist function, giving each faction a seat at the table and a sense of having arrived. Yet even as conservatives in the 1980s gradually escaped the wilderness for the promised land inside the beltway, the world they wished to conquer was changing in ways that threatened their newfound power. Ask yourselves this question. What has been the most historically significant date in our lifetime? September 11th, 2001? Perhaps. But surely the other such date was November 9th, 1989, the night that the Berlin Wall came down. Since 1989, since the downfall of communism in Europe and the end of what Ronald Reagan called the evil empire, one of the hallmarks of conservative history has been the reappearance of factional strains in the Grand Alliance. One source of rancor has been the ongoing dispute between the neoconservatives and their non-interventionist critics over post-Cold War foreign policy. Another fault line divides many libertarians and social conservatives on such issues as the legalization of drugs and same-sex marriage, as we all know. Aside from these two built-in philosophical tensions, two fundamental facts of political life explain the recrudescence of these intramural debates in recent years. The first is what I call the perils of prosperity. Since 1980, prosperity has come to conservatism, and with it a multitude of niche markets and specialization on a thousand fronts. But with prosperity has also come sibling rivalry, tribalism, and a weakening of what I call movement consciousness, that is, the awareness that you're part of a larger team or a movement. The vast right-wing conspiracy, as Hillary Clinton has called it, has grown too large for any single institution or magazine, like National Review in its early days, to serve as the movement's gatekeeper and general staff. No longer does American conservatism have a commanding ecumenical figure like Buckley or Reagan. And I would add that technology has something to do with that, namely the advent of the world of cyberspace 
there are no longer gatekeepers because on the internet there are no gates. The second fundamental fact of political life that explains the renewal of friction on the right was the stunning end of the Cold War in the 1990s. Inevitably, the question then arose, could a movement so identified with anti-communism survive the disappearance of the communist adversary in the Kremlin? Without a common external foe upon whom to concentrate their minds, it has become easier for former allies on the right to succumb to the bane of all coalitions, the sectarian temptation. It is an indulgence made infinitely easier by the internet. The conservative intellectual movement, of course, did not vanish in the 1990s. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that unyielding anti-communism supplied much of the glue in the post, to the post-war conservative coalition, and that the demise of communism in Europe weakened the fusionist imperative for American conservatives. One of the earliest signs of this was the rise in the 1980s and early 90s of a militant group of conservative traditionalists who took the label paleoconservatives. Initially, paleoconservatism was a response to the growing prominence within the conservative ranks of the erstwhile liberals and social democrats known as the neoconservatives. To angry paleocons, led by Patrick Buchanan, among others, the neocons were interlopers who, despite their recent movement to the right, remained at heart secular, crusading Wilsonians and believers in the welfare state. In other words, the paleos argued, not true conservatives at all. As the Cold War faded, paleoconservatism introduced a discordant note into the conservative conversation. Fiercely and defiantly nationalist rather than internationalist, skeptical of global democracy and post-Cold War entanglements overseas, fearful of the impact of third world immigration on America's historically Europe-centered culture, and openly critical of the doctrine of global free trade, paleoconservatism increasingly resembled much of the American right before 1945, before, that is, the onset of the Cold War. Despite the initial furor surrounding the paleoconservatives, they have remained a relatively small faction within the conservative community. Still, as the post-Cold War epoch settled in during the 90s, they were not alone among conservatives in searching for new sources of unity a new fusionism, as it were, for a new era. Thus, in recent years, we have heard about compassionate conservatism, reform conservatism, national greatness conservatism, constitutional conservatism, among other formulations reflective, I think, of this search. American conservatism, then, as I have described it this evening, is fundamentally a coalition. And like all coalitions, it contains within itself the potential for splintering, and never more so, perhaps, than right now. For as the Cold War and its familiar polarities continue to recede from public memory, new trends and conflicts are filling the vacuum. Consider this datum. More people are now on the move in the world than at any time in the history of the human race. And more and more of them are making America their destination. The number of international students, for instance, attending American colleges and universities now exceeds one million per year, more than triple what it was in 1980. In addition, the United States is now admitting a million immigrants into permanent legal status every year more than any other nation in the world, unless you include Germany last year. This unprecedented worldwide intermingling 
not just of goods and services, but of peoples and cultures, is accelerating, with consequences we have scarcely begun to fathom. Among them, the rise in recent years of a post-national, even anti-national sensibility among our progressive elites and young people steeped in multiculturalism. Among such people, the traditional conservative belief in American exceptionalism is scorned. This brings me to the phenomenon of the hour, insurgent populism. In its simplest terms, populism, defined as the revolt by ordinary people against overbearing and self-serving elites, has long existed in American politics. In its most familiar form, populism has been left-wing in its ideology, targeting bankers, wealthy capitalists, and corporations as villains, the millionaires and billionaires in Bernie Sanders lingo. But populism in America has sometimes taken a conservative form as well. It did so in the 1970s and 80s to some extent under the leadership of Ronald Reagan, who brilliantly articulated a populistic libertarian aversion to meddlesome and unaccountable government. If left-wing populism has traditionally aimed its fire at big money, the corporate elite entrenched on Wall Street, right-wing populism of the Reaganite and Tea Party variety has focused its wrath on big government, the progressive public sector elite ensconced in Washington. Until a few months ago, it appeared to me that the election of 2016 might become a showdown between these two competing forms of populism in the wake of the Great Recession of 2008. What I did not foresee before last summer was the volcanic eruption in 2015 of a new and even angrier kind of populism, a hybrid which I will call Trumpism. <laughs> Politically, Trump's and Trumpism's antecedents may be found in the presidential campaigns of Ross Perot and Patrick Buchanan in the 1990s. Both of them ran twice for president, you may recall. Intellectually, Trumpism bears a striking resemblance to the anti-interventionist, anti-globalist, immigration restrictionist, and America first worldview propounded by various paleoconservatives during the 1990s and ever since. It is no accident that Buchanan, for example, is overjoyed by Donald Trump's candidacy. Instead then of venting anger exclusively at left-wing elites as conservative populism in the Reaganite and Tea Party variants has done, the Trumpist brand of populism is simultaneously assailing conservative and Republican elites, including the Buckley-Reagan conservative intellectual movement that I described earlier. In particular, Trumpism is deliberately breaking with the conservative internationalism of the Cold War era and with the pro-free trade supply-side economics orthodoxy, orthodoxy that has dominated Republican Party policy making since 1980. So, what manner of rough beast is this? It's our come round at last. Speaking analytically, I believe we are witnessing in an inchoate form the birth of a political phenomenon never before seen in this country, an ideologically muddled nationalist populist major party combining both left-wing and right-wing elements. In its fundamental outlook and public policy concerns, it is somewhat akin to the National Front in France, the United Kingdom Independence Party in Great Britain, the Alternative for Germany Party, and similar protest movements in Europe. Most of these insurgent parties are conventionally labeled right-wing, but some of them are noticeably statist and welfare statist in their economics, as is Trumpism 
in certain respects. And nearly all of them are driven by a conviction that the traditional ruling elites in those countries have neither the competence nor the will to make things better. It is a disturbing development, which has now led to what can only be described as a struggle for the mind and soul of American conservatism. In these stormy circumstances, it would be foolish to prophesy the outcome. Suffice it to say that in all my years as a historian of conservatism, I have never observed as much dissension on the right and, so, and as much antagonism toward one another as there is at present. Now, some may see in this cacophony a sign of vitality, and perhaps it will turn out to be. But conservatives, more than ever, need minds as well as voices. In this season of discontent, it might be useful for conservatives to step back for a moment and ask a simple question. What do conservatives want? What should they want? Perhaps by getting back to basics, conservative intellectuals can restore some clarity and direction to the debate. What do conservatives want? To put it in elementary terms, I would say that they want what nearly all conservatives since 1945 have wanted. They want to be free. They want to live virtuous and meaningful lives. And they want to be secure from threats both beyond and within our borders. They want to live in a society whose government respects and encourages these aspirations while otherwise leaving people alone. Freedom, virtue, and safety. Goals reflected in the libertarian, traditionalist, and national security dimensions of the conservative movement as it has developed over the past three generations. In other words, there is at least a little fusionism in nearly all of us. It might be something to build on. And here, I suggest in closing, is where ISI comes in. For more than 60 years, in its unobtrusive and ecumenical manner, ISI has been instructing college students about the intellectual and spiritual foundations of Western civilization, the resources needed for a free and humane existence. ISI has pursued it's this mission in fulfillment of its motto, to educate for liberty, knowing that we all start out in life as rough beasts who need to be educated for liberty if we are to secure its blessings. However events unfold politically in the coming turbulent months, let us remember our heritage and rededicate ourselves to ISI's mission. Thank you.